Welcome into Sports Memo's Betting Podcast, NHL edition with our NHL expert, North of the Border, Andrew McGinnis. Welcome in, buddy. How are you doing today? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. How are you, Drew? Uh, doing good, man. We're going to break down these games on the NHL slate for Tuesday and uh, also hit some questions from uh, Twitter and talk about uh, what we're getting close to All-Star break. When's the All-Star break, McGinnis? Yeah, this weekend. So pretty much uh, tomorrow we got five games and some games on Wednesday, and then that's all she wrote for uh, for a few days in the NHL. And do you recommend betting on the All Star game at all, or any? They they do like uh, stuff before then as well, like how how fast they can hit it and everything like that, right? Yeah, actually, I love betting the All Star game, uh, especially since they've kind of broken down into divisions instead of uh, conferences. I feel like totals betting for sure. Uh, you could actually make a good amount of money betting totals betting. Uh, I think that, you know, especially that final game, uh, look towards betting the under. It's always that way too high of a number because it's the all-star game. Uh, the first games, I mean, it's a round robin. It's kind of a bracket tournament there, Drew. I would say in the first games, look to bet the over. And then nearing the last games, the players start taking it a little more seriously. So they play a little more defense, look to bet the under uh, near the tail end of it. But it's a great time. Uh, you can get some plus money, some good value on some of these uh, props. It, it, it's you know it's it's a lot of fun because there's so many different skills competitions and uh, you know goalie props different stuff like that Drew it's a lot of fun if you're a hockey fan you really enjoy watching that stuff. Cool man. Well, let's get after the Tuesday card. We got game number 13, 14 here. Winnipeg at Carolina. Looks like Carolina heavy favorites here, minus 170 to minus 180 as we're talking later on Monday. Total of six in this one, McGinnis. Yeah, I mean, I'll start right by, by, right here by saying uh, this. there's no way this number should be minus 170 here for the Carolina Hurricanes. There's far too much talent here for Winnipeg for it to be that generous of a number uh, for the Carolina Hurricanes. However, this is a team that at least is kind of beating some better teams. But Winnipeg, uh, they're just a very on and off inconsistent team. That's been kind of their name of their game uh, here this year. But the biggest thing to mention for this team has been their injuries. All season long so far, it's been either a star, a star defense player, uh, an important guy in the forward position, either a top player or a second-line player in and out of the lineup. We've got Adam Lowry still injured. Uh, Nathan Bellew on the defense is out. I mean, it's you know if you're missing guys that are important, uh, Brian Little, another guy, has a concussion uh, for his Winnipeg Jets team. If you're missing these key guys at all different positions, uh, it starts to hurt your team. And, uh, you know, both defensively and offensively, I wanted to mention the over in this game because although Carolina is tending to get teams to go under the total with them, and, you know, that's that's a Carolina style. I mean, for a long time right now, I mean, this is a team that likes to play defensively. They're very hard checking. But Winnipeg seems to be dragging every team, Drew, uh, into an over type of hockey game and a higher scoring game. They've seen quite a few games that they've played in recently where they've seen six and a half as their total. Today, it's just a six. Uh, listed here as we record this podcast and you know I think right before that uh, all-star break and before they kind of get their their rest with their family and, and sit back for a few days both teams are going to be fired up with this one and the, the shot count is going to be very very heavy and like I said Winnipeg has been bringing a lot of teams into high scoring games Chicago uh, scored five on them Tampa scored seven against them Boston scored five the list goes on people are scoring against Winnipeg so I'll look over six years my lean I don't recommend a play on the side here. I mean, Carolina, minus 170, not what I'd like to do here. I mean, I would actually look at an underdog price here. If you're going to look at better dog, this is a good price. We're talking about a value perspective. Uh, no way uh, I'm, I'm risking that much uh, to bet on Carolina on the money line. McGinnis, next game up, we got game number 15-16, New York Islanders versus the New York Rangers in the battle for New York. We got a total of six and a competitively priced game here, man, seeing about minus 110. Uh, on each side. Yeah, always interesting. This is like, you know, in every sport, really, we get the two New York teams. There's always uh, an interesting matchup between the two of them. And uh, it, it no matter really where they are in the standings, it seems it's always a competitive game. Uh, right now, this Islanders team, though, one in five in their last six games, they started to fall off a little bit. Uh, and I think the belief, I believe the reason why is because, you know, they, they've really lost their scoring touch. But not just that. Uh, their defense has gone out the window. And that's kind of was their bread and butter, Drew. Uh, the bulk of last season and the season before that. Uh, you know, giving up six goals against Washington. Uh, six goals against the Rangers uh, in two, two meetings ago. I mean, this is a team that's dropped two straight games to the New York Rangers. I mean, and look at the standings-wise. Look at how they've been playing uh, over the past even, like, year or two. 
Um, if I would have told you that over the past two times these teams have played, uh, the Rangers have kind of gotten the best of the Islanders, um, you know, it, it would surprise me to hear anyone say that. So looking at this spot here, you'd think the Islanders would come ready to play and come ready to get going here, um, you know, snap this three-game losing streak they have right now because they have not been playing good hockey. The Rangers are still a team that are very messy. Uh, they allow a lot of goals. Uh, they're disorganized quite a bit, and they don't, they don't really show consistency uh, goaltending-wise. However, one interesting thing to, to mention about this team is that right now they're kind of running three goaltenders, something that you don't really ever hear about in the National Hockey League. We've, we've, heard, we've heard about it from a few different teams this year, actually, where they have one guy up from the AHL uh, and two of their starting goaltenders, and they're kind of mixing in that third stringer and seeing how he fits in. And usually when we see that happening, that means that one guy is going to get traded away. Uh, and for me, I think it's Alexander Georgiev because there's no way they're going to trade away Henrik Lundqvist with that contract he has, his history with New York. So, you know, it, it, it causes a little bit of concern because you think that this New York team is kind of getting their act together. But juggling that many goalies around so much uh, can definitely make it confusing for teams and, and difficult to kind of have one goalie settle in. You know, if, you, if you're only playing one game every three, four times, then it's kind of hard to settle in and get a rhythm. So... Uh, I really think the Islanders get this one, and uh, they've you know dropped two straight games to them. One of them was in pretty embarrassing fashion. Like you said at the top, the Battle of New York here. I'll go with the Islanders here, minus 115. Yeah, that, that situation with the three goaltenders, that would almost make me look to, to, to fade that team because they couldn't get any consistency out of the spot. Exactly, yeah, that's what I'm doing right here. I mean, I, I think that eventually it'll just get, it'll start to wear on them. Um, you know, for the time being, it's been working. But like I said, I don't think it will be consistent with them. You, you want to have one guy that's in there more often than not. Like that's The net is his. You know, if I was a goaltender, I would be kind of pissed off if I found out that I, you know, I had a win or I'm playing all right. The next time I realize that next game comes up, I'm not playing. Game after that, it's somebody new. You know, you want to have some consistency in nets. And, you know, Drew, let, let's, let's just say it right now. I mean, 6-2. Uh, was was the last time? I mean, these two teams played, or, the, or three two for the Rangers, uh, and, and uh, the time before that was six two for the Islanders. So I think that in that close game that the Rangers played against uh, the Islanders last time they played it is is going to be kind of something that they're going to remember and kind of want to have some uh, rapid revenge. I guess some people might say. <laughs> well said there, McGinnis. We got game number 17-18, my Golden Knights here, Vegas Golden Knights. Total of six at Boston. Looks like the Bruins minus 140 favorites at home, McGinnis. Yeah, I feel like there's always a Vegas night, a Knights game that we're talking about uh, each week. You and I are doing this, Drew. But uh, something that has to be mentioned, I'm sure, news that you've heard about. I'm sure it's a talk of the town. Gerard Gallant, uh, the fire of the head mm -hmm. coach yeah. uh, of the Vegas Golden Knights. I mean, that's just despicable. It's uh, it's just it's hard to fathom as a, as a hockey follower and someone that follows the game on a day-in, day-out basis. However, one thing you have to look at, and I think hockey fans have to remember, and I'm kind of being the devil's advocate here, Drew, when I say this, uh, is that it's very easy to lose a locker room in the NHL. And whether or not you like your coach doesn't mean you like them or not. It just means that they're tactics and their strategies are kind of going out the window and you see that more often in hockey than any other sport and the biggest reason that I feel that, that that's the, the case is because it's not like in the NBA where you're managing a top you know a big three or, or five or six players that you have to really worry mm -hmm. about in the NHL you're managing you know 15 to 20 players right and you know it doesn't matter if it's your, your top guy or your guy in your fourth line if you're not connecting with one you're probably not connecting with the other guy as well and so I really do feel like, you know, after a few rough games, some defensive collapses, they said, hey, we got to mix it up. But, you know, the, de the decision to hire, uh, you know, the, the, the coach that they really, really shouldn't have hired, Pete DeBoer, I mean, that's something that shouldn't have happened. Uh, I mean, this is a guy that uh, coached the San Jose Sharks, Drew, and that's the team that, uh, you know, that, that took them out. I mean, I mean, this just can't happen. I mean, this is just... It's kind of like, uh, you know, hiring hiring your arch nemesis. I mean, you can't hire the coach that was kind of your rival. I, I, don't, I don't really understand the move. I also don't really understand the fact that they didn't wait much time to do it. It's almost like it was planned. That stuff bothers me. That's not really pure class. We saw the exact same thing happen to Gerard Gallant when he was in Florida. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, Drew, what I've heard, I mean, I'm nowhere close to the Vegas team. 
I thought Gerard Gallant was a great guy. So I, I'm not really sure how that ended up happening to him that way. You got to go out there and at least peacefully fire someone. Don't hire the coach that he was beefing with last year. You know, the day after you 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 know you you, you fire him. Yeah. But, I mean, anyway, that's just that's just me talking and giving out my opinion. But uh, look, as far as this game goes. The Vegas Golden Knights are still struggling, and I thought that they would get their act together. The way I've been handicapping coaches firing, and it's been working for, for a little while now, where I would look at the game after, I would bet the total, bet the total over, and that was the game against Ottawa. I got the push, and uh, their next game was against Montreal, and I figured, okay, you had one game under your belt with a new coach. Next game, you have to get the win in a strong fashion and pressure coach. Uh, they ended up blowing a lead, or they ended up uh, falling to the Montreal Canadiens 5-4. Uh, they were down 4-2, came back, made it 4-4, ended up losing in the shootout. So a good effort, but still, I mean, to lose to a Montreal Canadiens team, who I hate to say it as a Montreal fan, is definitely not someone the, Mon- the Vegas Golden Knights should be having any trouble with. It's worrisome. The good news is, the only good news is that I see out of this is, is that, uh, you know, this is a team that, is on the tail end of the road trip. They should be settled in now. There's no there's no road factor. Uh, they know the All-Star break's coming up. This is a team with quite a few vets on the team. They should be able to have a competitive game here. And I'm going to look towards the over six because the Boston Bruins, who, as I was thinking, was quite a bit of an under team for a very long time. And I'm sure, you know, after the All-Star break and the closer and closer we get to the playoffs, they will be an under team again. This is a Boston team giving up quite a few goals. Uh, and they're starting to score again. Uh, their top guys are fine in the back of the net. Their secondary scoring is finally there. They had a home and home uh, against Boston, or excuse me, sorry, against the Pittsburgh Penguins. They scored four goals in both those games. They scored five goals in their meeting against Philadelphia, a couple games before that. Five goals against Winnipeg. Uh, this is a Boston team that's fine in the back of the net, but they're also getting scored on as well. And uh, Vegas is desperate right now. They're starting to get some wins, but they're also letting some goals in. We'll go over six here, Drew. Uh, this is the play here until the Vegas Golden Knights can crack down defensively. Yeah, and that, that coach getting fired, uh, that was a big talk around the town. A lot of people not really liking it from the vibe I'm getting from uh, the, the Vegas Golden Knights fans, but uh, is what it is. And we got game number 19, game number 20. Up next, Pittsburgh versus Philadelphia. Looks like uh, the Penguins, minus 130 to minus 140 point favorites in this one on the road. Total of six, Pitt versus Philadelphia. Yeah, this is a rivalry. I mean, uh, everybody knows that the, the bad blood this Penguins team has with the Flyers. This is one of those old-time hockey games where no matter how close these teams are in the standings, it's very typical, very similar to the whole New York Islanders and New York Rangers thing. Uh, it's always a good game between these two teams. Uh, but I got to look towards uh, this Pittsburgh Penguins team right now. This is a team that's rolling. They've gotten their act together. Drew, nobody else in this league, no other team, has faced as much adversity as this Pittsburgh Penguins team uh, and had so much success. I've never seen it before. Uh, they've had so many different injuries all throughout their lineup. They had their captain, Sidney Crosby, out for a few months. Uh, they had so many of their scorers. Now they have Jake Gensel, who was out for the season with a shoulder injury. They've had defensive issues all year long, and they've still been able to battle through it. And, and Drew, I'll sit here and tell you, I was guilty of fading them time and time again, and I'm done. I'm done with it. I mean, this is a team to be taken seriously. They're going to make a run at the playoffs. And, uh, you know, they've just shown that it, hockey is the most important thing with hockey. It's having depth. Not just one guy, not two guys to score for you. Countless guys to score for you. Uh, and they are, more importantly, uh, playing better, not just at home, but on the road. Six and one, Drew, their last seven games on the road. And six and one, their last seven, when playing on the road against Philadelphia. Philly's good, but they're giving up too many goals. They're too sloppy. Uh, and I, right now, I like Pittsburgh's goaltending way better than Philadelphia's. We have a Pittsburgh money line here, minus 130. And I would bet that sooner than later. And last game on the board here, McGinnis, we got 21-22 Florida, the Panthers at the Chicago Blackhawks. Not seeing a line here, man. Do you want to hit this? Yeah, I'll just I'll just say over, over, over. That's all I'm going to say here, Drew. I mean, these are two teams that uh, really struggle defensively. We're going to see some goals here in this game. Florida's playing tonight. Uh, the Chicago Blackhawks have kind of found their scoring touch again. Their top guys, uh, Patrick Kane, just scored his 1,000th career point with the Chicago Blackhawks. You know, this is, you know, I'm very repetitive when I talk about some of these higher scoring teams, but it's very true. Um, in order to be a successful hockey team, 
you can't just score goals. I mean, we saw it with the Maple Leafs uh, over the past week. I mean, they're playing in games where they're scoring four or five goals and they're still losing. Um, you know, the Florida Panthers, your, your hometown team there, Drew, they beat the Toronto Maple Leafs eight to four. Uh, when do you hear about a score like that in the National Hockey League? Not too often. And these two teams are very similar to the Leafs as far as they have the offensive talent, but they do not have uh, the ability to st- shut teams down on defense. And I- I've actually been getting quite a bit into these first period over wagers as well, Drew. I've been tracking some of these uh, these trends. I know VEASAN, some of those guys on there uh, are really, really good with the first period. It's kind of a trend that they got into last year. And I've been following it on different networks. And, you know, you can find some good trends. Eight of the last nine, I believe, for the Chicago Blackhawks right now have gone over the total in the first period. So I'll probably have a wager on the first period over in this game as well. Um, yeah, like, I know no real play on the side. I have to base it off of what I see tonight out of Florida, uh, which is why I'm not giving out a side play on this game, Drew. All right, McGinnis. Well, let's hit some questions here. We got um, Matty C, the Matty C one on Twitter saying, thoughts on fading the public. Does it factor in in the NHL, McGinnis? Yeah, I was having a conversation about this with someone just a few days ago, and I would say that and the NHL might be the least sport you want to look at it with. I, I mean, you've heard a lot of different guys. I think I heard Teddy Cover say it uh, a few weeks ago on one of his podcasts with you. I mean, if you want to make money in the NFL, go ahead, open up any type of service, any type of website, uh, and check what the public's on, and you could actually make money going on the opposite side sometimes, especially, uh, you know, some of these teams the public loves to hammer. But... In the NHL, it's not a it's not a point spread sport, right? It's it's just a it's a money line sport, and I think that's the biggest difference. That you can't really make money uh, fading the public as much. However, you can look you can look at really where the where the action is going and, and try and predict what uh, what type of odds you're going to get in the future. For example, uh, over the past two weeks, you and I have done this show. I've noticed at least two or three of our games go up at least twenty twenty five cents. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, so trying to predict. Whether or not you should wait on a number or, or or get on it now is something that's really important. So try and predict kind of where the public or sharp money is going to go is important in the hockey. Okay. Well said there, McGinnis, answering that question. Um, we got Zach Weber. Hi, Andrew. I've become a big fan of NHL props for player assists over 0.5, finding some great value spots. Any takes on NHL player props? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, Drew, I'll be quite honest with you, I don't do them too often. I've been getting more into doing uh, player goal scorers. Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm handicapping a few different sports right now, and I, I'm diving into hockey, uh, doing these shows. I don't really have time to look at the assists and, and shots and that kind of thing. If hockey's the main thing you're handicapping, go ahead and dive into it. Because you can, like I said, that's the one thing uh, where trends actually come into a factor, come into account. I mean, um, I'm betting some of these goal scoring props right now, Drew, and you can get some, you know, plus 200, plus 300 prices on some players that are starting to heat up. And a uh, perfect example uh, is, you know, some players on Toronto, uh, you know, you, you got the top, top guys and you got some lower, like second, third line guys that are not really going to be favored to score or even in the plus 100 ranges. And you can grab them plus 200, plus 300. So I bet those, I think they're profitable, but you know, what I want to tell everybody out there about these props, Drew, and I think you can definitely second this as well, is uh, manage your bankroll properly when you're doing this stuff. Because if you're out there betting, you know, five or six goal scoring props a night, a couple assists, a couple shots, and you have a rough night uh, and, you know, you're betting a unit on each pick. I mean, it's, it could go tough. So, I mean, I would say quarter unit maybe on each of those and uh, definitely, you know, stick to one team or a couple different teams. I wouldn't I wouldn't scatter everything all over the board. Okay, and kind of tailing off of what you were just saying there, McGinnis, we got Drew Thrasher saying, what's the deal with these lines, question mark? Every time it gets around minus 300, minus 360, and the dogs show up. Any comments there? Uh, I mean, you know, that's just a typical za- example of, uh, of, of a team falling asleep and not being prepared against a, a, a pretty much a poor team. You know, we got a perfect example here. A game, again, we're recording this podcast on a Monday evening. Uh, today in Martin Luther King Day, we had uh, the Colorado Avalanche taking on the Detroit Red Wings, Drew. And Detroit went ahead and scored one nothing. They opened the scoring up. They got on the board first. Colorado ended up, ended up taking that game. Sometimes against the, the lower-skilled teams, it takes these higher-skilled teams 
a couple minutes or maybe a period or two to wake up and get their act together. Uh, so sometimes there's certain flat spots as well. And to answer this guy's question, if I was you and I'm looking to bet uh, on some of these underdogs, wait to see if you see a team that's played really well against a few solid teams and then all of a sudden they have a random game against a really, really bad team. It honestly might be a good spot uh, to bet against that solid team and take the plus value because that team might be just looking at it too lightly, you know, coming into it as a flat spot. Some teams show up against better teams uh, than, than bad teams. And I know it sounds really kind of anticlimactic, but it, it's very true. It's a very big mental game. Um, and, and you might show up against a better team than you will almost against the worst team sometimes. All right, man. You're hitting 70% in the NHL the last five days. Also uh, pretty good in college and the NBA and up 32% ROI return on investment, hitting 61%, 30 and 19 his last seven days. He's Andrew McGinnis. we got specials for the week for just 59 bucks. You can get all of his play it plays in every sport for just 59 bucks for the week. Also a coupon code here, Andrew345 for the rest of his NHL season for 345 bucks. Huge discount there at sportsmemo.com. That coupon Coupon code is Andrew345 at checkout. McGinnis, anything else you want to throw out there before we shut this down, man? No, I just wanted to remind everybody else what we were talking about uh, out the gate with uh, those NHL All-Star game. Mm-hmm. You know, bet the over uh, in, in that first game. You know, the first game for these teams, there's rounds in this through. And uh, that championship game, bet the under because it's going to be very high priced. And uh, teams, no matter what it, what it is, these athletes are com- they're competitors. They want to win, Drew. Uh, so they're going to probably show up and try a little bit more uh, for the last game. So, you know, it, it's one of those things. I, I think that people are going to want to bet the over in every one of these games and think that it's going to be a big joke. Once it gets down to the final game, they're going to care a little more and uh, probably try a little bit harder. And, and I, I know er- er- everybody out there listening is probably a, a, a sharper NHL handicapper than I am, unfortunately, but uh, I do like to tell you whenever you give out a a good best bet and hockey is such a great game, such a great sport to to actually watch live, man. Um, What do you mean by that to to any casual fans out there that are watching when you say like tournament games? Well, yeah, so it's so it's uh, pretty much it used to be just the Western Conference versus the Eastern Conference, Drew. Yeah, Uh, but but now there's so many different divisions. So uh, the Metropolitan Division, the Pacific Division, the Atlantic Division, so on and so forth. So it's broken into little mini teams. So now instead of it just being two teams, the Western Conference and the Eastern Conference, it's all the NHL divisions competing in little mini oh. tournaments. So that's kind of what it is now. And uh, it makes it a lot more interesting because it's, you know, it's it's way it's it's way more broken up. And and that way you can kind of handicap it better. I, I find it way easier to handicap the All-Star game. I didn't use to take it too seriously uh, when it was just East versus West. But now you've got Atlantic, uh, Metropolitan, uh, Central, and the Pacific. So it becomes two teams. Now it turns into four. So they're going to play each other and then kind of get a couple of games early in. But like I said, this tournament style, the later it gets, and you can still bet these like in-game or prior to the finals or whatever, uh, um, you know, for all of you guys out there, most people that are you know betting online have in-game capability. Look to bet that under in the finals, and I look forward to talking about this with you on Monday, Drew, and I hope you do it as well. Yeah, no, this this is interesting. I, I like that that they're going to be playing a little round robin here tournament, Atlantic Metropolitan. You're right, man. What about like something that I've noticed in MLB, the All Star Game, is you know these guys are on a team with everybody in their division. I'm guessing they play each other more so than the other team. Is there any issues with these guys not liking each other? You know, I feel like you you almost perfectly segued that into this because uh, I have just the answer for that, and it's I'm really happy you asked that. So, um, pretty much, there's a top line for the for the Edmonton Oilers. It's Zach Cassian, Connor McDavid, and Leon Draisaitl, and two of those guys really belong on a top line. One of them doesn't. That guy is Zach Cassian. He's a real big tough guy, Drew. Uh, and he's kind of found his way on the, on the top line with McDavid, supposedly the best player in the world, and Dreisaitl as well. Uh, they're kind of like yin and yang, uh, those guys, those two guys. And then um, Cassian's kind of out there to protect them, so to speak. He's on the top line to be that physical presence uh, with them. Anyway, so there's a player on the Calgary Flames. His name is Matthew Kachuk. Uh, famous last 
East name, Keith Kachuk. A lot of hockey yeah. fans would know that last name. And anyway, so he's a, he's a borderline dirty player, I guess you could say, Matthew Kachuk. I mean, he, he plays on the edge, I guess you might say. And so he's kind of as part of that new generation hockey, whereas Cassian's a part of that old generation hockey. Anyway, there was a game where those two teams played uh, Battle of Alberta, Calgary, and Edmonton. And pretty much Kachuk took not one, not two, but three runs on Cassian from behind the net. He absolutely smashed him. I think he hit his head at one point. Uh, it was just blind side hits. He was going almost out of his way, Drew, uh, to hit Cassian. It wasn't like it was part of the play. He was realizing when he could pick his spots. And then Cassian pretty much looked up after one of the hits, saw it was him, and, and jumped him. Absolutely jumped him. And pull, pulled him to the ice, started beating him down. Anyway, the reason why I'm saying this is because in an interview, uh, Leon Dreisaitl was asked, hey, if, if you end up on a line with Matthew Kachuk in the All-Star game, uh, what are you going to do? Like, if you're playing with him, and he goes, uh, well, I'll, I'm just going to skate off the ice. He, he goes, I'll, I'll just, you know, I'm not going to play with him. And, you know, and that's the funny thing. I always found that funny as a kid growing up, too, is that, like, you see these guys that are, you know, checking each other, fighting each other, you know, talking smack to each other. And then during this All-Star game, they're skating around, chatting, talking about life and families. But I think situations like that that I just mentioned, you don't forget about no, not at all, man. That's interesting. And uh, I wonder if that could be worked into uh, some sort of uh, a, a betting advantage for the sports better. But uh, overall, great stuff, McGinnis. And did you want to throw anything out before we shut this down? No, we're good to go. We're good to go. I have no real best bet. I just wanted to go through those games uh, tomorrow, Drew, if that's all good, and uh, get some of those questions and uh, talk about the All-Star game a bit. So uh, good to have this weekly podcast. Yeah, absolutely, guys. And we're going to be doing this each and every Monday going forward, uh, late night on Monday. And uh, it, it will be the Tuesday card, so you can get down on some of the early lines. But, guys, if you're liking the content, please give us a thumbs up, the like button. And uh, feel free to comment below the video or on Twitter, at McGinnis Picks or at Drew Martin Bets. So, uh, guys, best of luck with your bets, and we will talk tomorrow.